Welcome home. You belong here. We are so excited to share with you what is happening in the life of our church. Check it out. S is just around the corner. If you have not signed up your child, there is still time. We hope to see them at VBS 2024. Start the party. Signups are live on the RCC app and our website. Last Wednesday night for kids, junior high, and adult studies will be May 15th. This gives our leaders and volunteers an intentional season of rest for the summer months so they can come back refreshed and ready to roll in the fall. Thank you for your generosity. If you would like to participate financially with what God is doing through RCC, you can do so by visiting one of the giving boxes at the back of the worship center or online by clicking the giving tab on our app and website. Thanks for joining us for Sunday worship. We hope that you have a meaningful encounter with Jesus today. Good morning. How's everybody today? It's going to be a fantastic Sunday for many reasons, but one of which is our high school uh, worship team is going to lead us in worship day, so that's something to look forward to. I want to welcome you all here today. Uh, a couple things. If you're new, uh, we'd love to get to know you. There are some QR codes on the bulletin or in the card in the seat in front of you. Scan one of those and let us know you're here. We can get to know you. We'll reach out let you get to know us a little bit. Also, prayer requests are super important. As a, as a church family, we want to be praying for you. Let us know how we can pray for you, pray for your family, your neighbors, the people you see at Walmart, whatever. Uh, we want to be doing that. So make sure you scan those and take care of that so we can be praying together. Uh, happy Mother's Day. Uh, so if you have a, a lady sitting next to you, go ahead and tell them Happy Mother's Day. Give them a side hug or like punch them in the shoulder lightly to let them know you love them and appreciate them. Um, one of the cool things we do here at RCC, instead of giving you all flowers or uh, like a candy bar or something to take away, uh, we make a donation to one of our mission partners uh, um, on behalf of all the mothers in our church family. This year, that donation is going to Tracy's Heart, one of our mission partners. They're actually starting a computer training class to help the ladies in the program learn computer skills so that they have access to more jobs, and, and more jobs means they can be better sustainable and take care of themselves, and the money we're donating is helping offset the cost of that class for those ladies. So, ladies, Thank you very much for that kind uh, donation that you have made on your behalf or we made or whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a fantastic day. Uh, we've got a video to honor you mothers, and then we'll get started with some worship day. To the mothers and all the women who've cared for us, to the grandmothers, the spiritual mothers, and the waiting mothers, to the foster moms, the single moms, and the stepmoms, to the mentors, friends, guardians, and guides, to those who loved us, taught us, and showed us the way, to those who carried us, held our hand, and watched us grow, to those who experienced blessing this year, and to those who went through loss, to the heroic women all around us, we want to say thank you. Thank you for your courage, your kindness, and your faith in God. Thank you for shaping us, nurturing us, and walking with us through life. Thank you for showing us what it looks like to love and follow Jesus. Thank you for your prayers, your wisdom, and for never giving up on us. Thank you for boldly stepping into this high and holy calling. Thank you for the long nights and the short years and for the incredible joy. Whether this is a day of reflection, rejoicing, or remembering, we acknowledge you, we honor you, and we thank you today. Happy Mother's Day. As you can see, I'm not Ethan, and I am joined up here by all high schoolers. We are all in the student ministry. And we are all really excited to worship with you this morning, so if you could, please stand and join us as we worship God this morning. I 
is for me. Lost like a hurricane, I am a tree, bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercies. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us oh oh how he loves us how he loves us oh and oh be seated. Our students did an awesome job, didn't they? RCC family, thank you so much for being here this morning, and ha moms, happy Mother's Day. Today we honor you, all right? We honor you for your sacrifices. We honor you for all this unconditional love that you give. We honor you for the wisdom that you provide and the guidance that you give, the compassion that you extend. We even honor you for those moments when you take a Kleenex and you go, Pff. you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, just about all of us have a mom that's done that at least once. Those are good times, I'm telling you, all right? But we honor you moms, and we hope you have a great day. Today's your day. Can we just give our moms a round of applause as well this morning? <laughs> and so we say happy Mother's Day. Well, if you have your Bible with you, would you turn in the Old Testament to 1 Samuel chapter 1, 1 Samuel 1. 
That's where we're going to go today as we continue in this series that we've been in over the last few weeks that we're calling Blind Spots. And what we're doing in this series is we've just been talking about how we need to be intentional about looking over our shoulder for all these different emotions that can kind of sneak up on us and run us off the road in life. And today we're going to go to this 1 Samuel chapter 1 text and we're going to look at a woman named Hannah. And we're going to take a look at this discouragement that she experiences even in just trying to be a mom, all right? And so discouragement's what we want to talk about today. Now, Andy, our discipleship pastor, he's got a short video here about discouragement, so check this out, and then we're just going to dive right in. Discouragement is feeling disheartened and lacking courage to face the day. It's an attitude of hopelessness and defeat. It steals from our time, plummets our mood, and can make us hard to be around. It is an attitude that must be fought against. And that's what we, your RCC family and your mental health team, are ready to help you with. Well, when we are discouraged, it can be hard for people to be around us. And so today I just want to take some time and just talk about this emotion uh, of discouragement because all of us probably face this discouragement uh, from time to time. You know, you moms, you all experience a lot of different emotions, right? And, and you experience a lot of those different emotions even in the same day. And sometimes you go from one extreme to the other, even just from moment to moment. Like when you become a mom, you have this tiny, tiny little human. And now you have to give like this unconditional love to this human and you get to receive this unconditional love. And, but at the same time, you have all this angst, right? Because you're concerned about their safety and their, and, and their health and their future. And so you, you've got this unconditional love, but then you have this angst. Then there's also joy. Your children can bring you joy as you watch them discover things for the first time or you get to see them using their gifts and talents. It can bring joy when your kids are doing what they love to do or when they come to you for just a simple hug or they want to tell you about your day. Like, like you moms, listen, if you have a teenage son or daughter and they come to you and they ask for one-on-one -on -one time, that just like melts your mama's heart, doesn't it? I mean, if they want to tell you about their day or they want to ask you for a hug, so there's a lot of joy in that. There's also this joy that comes with just being able to spend time with them and being able to provide for the needs that they have. But then there's also, you know, this, 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 this stress that comes with being a mom and, and, and you have this pressure that you face from society. And there's this judgment that you feel. And then before you know it, you start to feel like a failure as a mom. You feel inadequate. You feel like you're not prepared for what it is that you need to do. There's pride that you feel when you're nurturing them and you're bonding with them. There's that sense of purpose and fulfillment by the things you get to do with them and for them on a daily basis. But then you, you, you go through these things and there comes this moment where they really don't need you very much anymore. And maybe in some ways you feel like they don't even want you anymore. And so you go from one extreme to the other. I know there are a lot of you moms that really treasure being together as a family, right? Like you enjoy the laughter and the late night pizzas and you love listening in on their conversations. And then as they grow and they get out of the house and then they come back and you get together as a big family, you get to just, you, you get to just hear them tell stories or they compare, compare about the times that they got into trouble or they talk about the advantages of being the older child or, or the younger child or the middle child, although I don't think there are any advantages to being the middle child. But you spend all this time together as a family and you really enjoy that, but then aren't there some moments where you just want to be all alone? Like you, you, you're together as a family, but then there are these times when you just want to be completely away from the family. There's the exhilaration that you experience when they take their first step or they say their first word or they read their first book. They go out on their first date. They buy their first house. They have their first child. You moms, let's admit, okay, when they have their first child, that's your first grandchild, and you all love that and want that, right? Right? And so there's the exhilaration from that. There's the exhilaration as they fall in love with Jesus and they find their purpose in life. But then there's the heartbreak. There's the heartbreak when they maybe get bullied at school. There's the heartbreak of having to let go as a mom. There's the heartbreak of watching them just walk away from Jesus and they try to find satisfaction in these things that are outside of God when you know full well that those things are never going to satisfy them. There's fulfillment that you experience as a mom. Like, like you get fulfillment as a mom because you get to kiss almost every boo-boo that your child has, especially when they're, when they're little, right? And it just seems to make it all better. I mean, you moms just kind of have the ability to do that. In fact, you get some fulfillment out of... Uh, like, like maybe you get fulfillment out of using these things right here, Band-Aids, 
right? Like you have this awesome privilege and responsibility of putting a Band-Aid on every scrape, every scratch, even the ones that aren't bleeding, right? I mean, it's just an opportunity for you to put a Band-Aid on, and it just seems to make it all better. And I mean, let's not confuse ourselves. It's not the Band-Aids that make it better. It's that motherly touch, right? So you get fulfillment out of using uh, Band-Aids. Maybe you get fulfillment out of every goop of this stuff that you put on. This is triple antibiotic ointment. This ought to be like a staple in every household, right? And so you get the opportunity to put this stuff on and you find some fulfillment in that. Or maybe you get fulfillment out of using this thing right here. It's a, it's a thermometer, so you stick it in their ear and then you get to tell them, oh, you know, here's your temperature and you get to doctor them up and, you know, try to make them feel better. Or maybe they have a headache and so they come to you and so you get to dispense the ibuprofen, right? Like you get to tell them how many they're going to take and when they're going to take it, <laughs> Right? And so there's a lot of satisfaction in that. Or maybe sometimes you get fulfillment out of using this right here. Now, this, this kind of, may, maybe it's hard for you to see, but this is, a, this is tweezers. And so you get a lot of fulfillment when you get to pull that splinter out of their little finger, their little toe, right? And sometimes you get like triple, quadruple doses of this fulfillment because sometimes you use all these things like at the same time. Like you get to use a pair of tweezers to pull the splinter out. Then you get to put some triple antibiotic ointment on and then cover it with a Band-Aid, right? And so you, you walk away and you're like, ha ha. Thor's got nothing on me, right? I'm the superhero. And then sometimes you get to take a Kleenex and rather than spit in it, you get to pinch somebody's bloody nose. And so you get a lot of fulfillment in those kinds of things. But then there's also helplessness, isn't there? Because there are times when you watch your kids suffer, you can't do anything to fix it. And so you moms, you experience a lot of different emotions, sometimes from one moment to the next. And there's no doubt that discouragement is one of those emotions. I had a mom recently tell me that the hardest thing for her to do with her grown kids is to keep her mouth shut. And maybe some of you moms can relate to that, right? And so you feel all these different emotions, and discouragement is one of those emotions that you face. In fact, all of us face discouragement from time to time. And so what I want to do this morning is just go to 1 Samuel chapter 1, and I just want to take a look at Hannah here and just talk about some things that we can do when we're being blindsided by discouragement. And so when you came in today, if you grabbed a bulletin there on the back, there's some space where you can fill in some blanks and take some notes if you'd like to do that. You can also do that in the RCC app if you've got that as well, all right? So let's just talk about this. What do we do when we're blindsided by discouragement? Well, first of all, we need to trust God's plan. We need to trust God's plan. I think this is something that's really important, and I think we see Hannah doing that here in the text. We have to trust his plan. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Hannah, okay? Hannah is married to a guy named Elkanah, and Elkanah has two wives, which is one too many, right? But he's got Hannah, and then he has another wife, and her name is Penina. And we find out that Hannah is really discouraged. And we find out here in verse 2 of chapter 1 why she's so discouraged. Look at this. It says, Penina had children, but Hannah had none. And so Hannah doesn't have any children, so it's really discouraging to her. In fact, the Bible tells us here in chapter 1 that the Lord had closed up her womb. So what that means is it's impossible for her to have children. Now what you need to understand is back in Hannah's day, your most important contribution that you could make to society as a woman was to have children. I mean, back in Old Testament times, everything that you were and who you were and your identity as a woman was found in whether or not you had children. It was found in being a mother. In fact, back in this day, people believed that if you didn't have children, then that was some sort of sign that God was holding something against you, something that was a part of your past or maybe a decision that you made, and so somehow he was punishing you. God's not for you. He's against you now, right? And sometimes that's what can happen with discouragement, right? Like we get discouraged about something that's happening in our lives, and it feels like God's not for us, that he's against us. But that's not the truth. In fact, here's the truth. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? And so God is not against us. He's actually for us, and he's for us to the point that he's willing to send his son to give his life on the cross for us. And so if you ever doubt whether or not God is for you, you just need to look to the cross. All right, so Hannah has all this discouragement because Penina has children, and she doesn't have any. And so there's this bitter rivalry that develops between Hannah and Penina. And every year, Elkanah and Hannah and Penina, they make a pilgrimage to Shiloh. So they travel to Shiloh so that they can worship and sacrifice. And this chapter 1 tells us that year after year, when they make this, uh, this trip to Shiloh, Penina provokes Hannah to the point that she weeps and she's not able to eat. 
And so understand, this is all really weighing on Hannah's heart here. Things are not turning out the way that she thought that they were going to turn out, but she has to trust in God's plan. And so look at what happens in the middle of all this discouragement. Look at what she does. I think this is so important. If you have your Bible open, look at verse 10. It says, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And so Hannah has all this discouragement. She's got all this anguish. And what she does in the middle of all this discouragement is she she prays to the Lord. She just pours out her soul to God. Now understand, there are things that are happening in Hannah's life that are turning out in a way that maybe she doesn't want them to turn out or maybe in a way that she didn't expect those things to turn out. And yet she has no control over those things. There's nothing that she can do about this. And so the only thing that she can do is she can just place her her trust in in God's hands. Now, I realize that for some of you today, for some of you ladies, today is a day of celebration, right? Because maybe uh, later on you're going to get some gifts from your kids, or maybe uh, maybe somebody's going to make you a meal, or maybe they're going to take you out for a meal, or maybe one of your kids is going to clean the house before the day's over. God is still a God of miracles. It can happen, all right? And so maybe that's what's going to happen, or maybe, uh, maybe you're going to get to take a nap or something like that. So for some of you, this is a really exciting day. It's a fun day. It's a day of celebration. But then I'm also very aware that for some of you, this is a hard day. I remember when we, my wife Marianne and I, when we decided that we were going to start a family and we were going to have kids, and it just wasn't, it wasn't working out the way that we wanted it to. It wasn't happening in the time that we wanted it to happen, and so Mother's Day would come around, and it was a really hard day because, you know, you had all these moms that were celebrating, and Mary Ann, she wanted to join in on the celebration, and she, she, she wasn't able to, and so it was, just, it was just a hard day for us, and we, we didn't understand that. We, we didn't understand the plan that God had for us at the time, and so we, we just had to trust. And so what I want you to know is if that's you, like if today is a hard day for you, I want you to know that Marianne and I, we, we know how that feels. We know the loneliness in that. We know the stress in that. We know the pressure in that. We know the discouragement in that. You know, when you want to have children, and for whatever reason, it's just, it's just not happening And so we didn't understand this plan that God had for us, and so we just had to pray, and we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed. And this is what Hannah does. In her deep anguish, she prays to the Lord. And look at verse 11. Look at what she prays. She made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Now, I want to make sure you understand what Hannah's doing here while she's praying, okay? Because you take a look at this on the surface, and it can be easy to, to think, well, Hannah's negotiating with God right now. But she's really not negotiating with God. You know what she's doing here? She's surrendering. I mean, this is Hannah's way of saying, look, God, I don't understand your plan. I don't understand why things are turning out the way that they're turning out right now. They're not turning out the way that I expected, and it's completely out of my control. But I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust this plan that you have for me, even when it's hard. Now, this doesn't have to be just about having children, right? And Maybe that's the discouragement that you have, or maybe this is a hard day for you because you have a broken relationship with your own mom. Or maybe it's a hard day for you because you have a broken relationship with one of your kids. Or maybe this is a hard day for you because somewhere along the way you, you lost one of your kids. But maybe the discouragement is over your job. Or maybe the discouragement's over another family member. Or maybe the discouragement's over your health. Or maybe it's over your finances. Or maybe it's about decisions that one of your children are making. And these decisions are just completely overwhelming you. And you can't really do anything about it. So you've just got to pray. You've got to surrender and trust that he knows what's best. Even when you don't understand it. I want you to look at this proverb. This is going to be familiar to some of us. Look at what it says. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. Now, that word submit there means to deeply know him. So can we just use that here for a second? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, deeply know him and he will make your paths straight. So you've got to trust him with all your heart. You can't lean on your own understanding. Look at what Jesus says. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So Jesus says, don't give in to a troubled heart. He says, just believe in God, believe in me. Just just trust in God, trust in me. 
When you trust Jesus, He will bring this peace and this comfort to your heart, and He will make your path straight. Look at what Jesus says on another occasion. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, understand Jesus is talking about surrender here. And so it would appear that a pillar to following Jesus is trusting him. A pillar to following Jesus is our willingness to surrender to him. And so whenever you're discouraged, whenever you're blinded by discouragement, and there's nothing that you can do about whatever it is that's discouraging you, when it's completely out of your control, you've just got to trust. You've got to trust that he has a plan for you. Because you may not be in control. Hear me on this now, okay? Understand this. You may not be in control of whatever it is that's happening in your life that's causing this discouragement, but guess who is? He is. So you've got to trust Him. You've got to pray, and you've got to tell Him that you trust Him, that you believe in Him, that you're not going to lean on your own understanding, but that you want to deeply know Him with all of your heart. Just tell Him that you're willing to surrender and follow Jesus with all of your heart. And so when we're blinded by discouragement, we need to trust this plan that God has for us even when it's hard. I think we also need to look for the answer. We need to look for the answer. I think that's something that's really important here because when there are things that are happening in your life that are turning out in a a way different than what you expected, like they're not happening the way that you thought that they were going to happen and they're completely out of your control, and so you make this decision that you're going to trust God's plan and you're going to pray like we just talked about, and you're going to tell Him that you're going to trust no matter how hard it is to understand it. When He gives you the answer, you've got to be ready. Like, you have to look for the answer that he's going to give you. And I see Hannah doing that here in the text. She finds the answer, and we're going to see that here. But before she finds the answer, she experiences a a little more discouragement. And so go to verse 12 here in chapter 1. I I want you to see this because you almost feel sorry for Hannah here. Look at verse 12. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli. So they've made their way to Shiloh. They're sacrificing and they're worshiping. And Eli is the priest. Okay, so like in our, in our language today, Eli is kind of like Hannah's pastor here. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Now, I want you to picture this. Hannah's got all this discouragement I mean, she is full of anguish. This is weighing heavily on her heart and on her soul. And so she's there with her priest, with her pastor, and she's praying. She's pouring out her heart to God. Her her lips are moving. There aren't any words that are coming out. And her pastor comes to her and accuses her of being drunk. Now, imagine this, because this is what it would be like. Let's say you come in here before this service starts this morning, and you sit down in your seat, and while we're waiting for the service to start, you decide that you're going to pray. You're just going to pray there where you're sitting. And so you start praying, and you're praying silently. Your lips are moving, but there aren't any words that are coming out. And so I come along, and I sit down in the seat next to you, and I kind of fold my arms like this, and I lean over. And while you're you know, doing that, I lean over, and I say, hey, do me a favor. Next Sunday, when you show up, lay off the sauce a little bit, would you? It's kind of like, because you're drunk right now. Now, if I did that, I'm only going to guess, and I think it's a pretty good guess, that you would be deeply offended. But I want you to look at what Hannah says to her priest, her pastor here. Look at this, verse 25. I love this. Or, I'm sorry, uh, look at what Hannah says. This is verse 15. Not so, my Lord. I'm pretty sure none of you would call me Lord, but not... <laughs> Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. She's not drunk. She's so discouraged that she's pouring out her soul to the Lord. Now, let me tell you what happens after this, because I want to kind of hit the fast forward button on this story here and move on in the text, all right? After this, the, the next day, the Bible tells us that Elkanah and Hannah and Penina, they get up and they head back home. And when they get home, it says that the Lord remembers Hannah and she's going to have a child. Now remember, her her womb has been closed up. It's impossible for her to have children, but she's going to have a child, and she has a son, and she names him Samuel, and eventually she makes her way back to Shiloh with Samuel and a three-year-old bull that she's going to sacrifice, and so she goes back to Eli, her priest, and look at this, verse 25 now. Look look at what happens. I love this. 
When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. Now, can you imagine how that conversation goes? I mean, Hannah's like, hey, remember me? I'm the one that you thought was drunk when I was just praying all the time. I prayed for this child. And the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord. I love what Hannah says here. The Lord has granted me what I've asked of him. She found the answer. She realized that Samuel was the answer to all these prayers that she had been praying. And so, friends, when you're discouraged, you've got to look for the answers that God gives you. You've got to pray with this attitude of expectation, right? So as you're trusting him, don't be afraid to tell him, God, I'm going to put this in your hands because I believe that you can do anything. And then believe that he's going to do something. Expect him to do something because nothing is impossible with him, right? I mean, remember what Jesus said? He says, with God, all things are possible, Nothing is impossible for God. And so when you place whatever it is that's discouraging you, when you put it in his hands, you've got to expect him to do something that he's going to give you an answer. Now, let me say this, all right? Whatever it is that you expect him to do, it may not be what you expected him to do, right? I mean, God's going to do what he's going to do. And so it, it may be something totally different, but you've got to expect him to do something. I mean, Paul tells us that God can do more than we could ever imagine. Look at what he says. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, not ours, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And so he can do more than we could ever imagine. He he can do more than we could ever ask him to do. So you've got to expect him to do something, but also understand that he may do something that you don't expect. Now let me say this, then we're going to move on. Hannah, she placed this in God's hands. She was expecting him to do something. And so when you place whatever it is that you are discouraged about in his hands and you expect him to do something, he's always going to answer. He's going to give you the perfect answer. It may not be what you expect, but he's going to give you the perfect answer. But I think it's also important for us to acknowledge that he's going to give you the perfect answer, but it's going to be in the perfect time. And a lot of times, his time frame doesn't match up with our time frame, does it? I mean, understand, friends, this is not something where, like, you trust him today and you pray about this today, and he's going to answer like an hour from now. He may not answer. He may answer an hour from now. He may not answer an hour from now. You know what? He may not answer tomorrow. He may not answer next week. He may not answer next month or next year. I mean, it might take him a while. But what you have to understand is that God's time frame is different than ours, right? Like, he's not bound by time like we are. He's not about 60 seconds, 60 minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days in a week. In fact, you want to hear his time frame? Look at this. This is what Peter says in the New Testament. He says, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Whoa. In other words, it might take him a little bit of time. But you're always going to get the perfect answer right at the perfect time. Let me give you an example of this. As many of you know, every Thanksgiving in November, we take up a Thanksgiving offering, and we use all the funds that are collected in that offering to give to one of our missions partners. Those funds are used outside the walls of RCC. And all the way back in November 2020, anybody remember 2020? That's kind of a year that's hard. Somebody's like, ugh. That's kind of a year that's hard to forget, right? But all the way back in November of 2020, we took up a Thanksgiving offering to send to a pastor in Myanmar so that they could build a church building because this pastor was having services inside his home, which was illegal, and he didn't care. I mean, he was doing it even at the risk of being arrested because that's how, I mean, that's how much he wanted to make sure that people heard about the gospel of Jesus, this good news about Jesus, right? And so we sent those funds to this pastor to be used to build a church there in Myanmar, and it was going to be combined with all these other funds from other churches so that they could then move into this church building and legally be able to share the gospel. So that was in November of 2020. February 1st, 2021, 
before those funds could be used, used and the construction project could begin, there was a military uprising, and the military overthrew the uh, ruling political party at the time, threw all the members of that party in, the j- in, in jail. And as a result, there was this widespread violence. There were uh, all these imprisonments. There were these kidnappings. And most of the time, it was Christians that were targeted. In November of 2023... Three years after we had collected this offering, three years, the area there in Myanmar was finally safe enough for construction to begin, and so they began began construction, and this past January, they moved into their new church building. Now, let me tell you what's happened since January. They held a Bible camp where they were able to share with the members of their community the good news about Jesus and how he can save them. They had a church planning conference where 35 pastors and leaders came together and they were, were able to equip them and train them. They have this uh, education uh, program that they've started that has 48 students in it right now. Most of them are Buddhists. And so they're learning Christian songs. They're hearing about who Jesus is and what he's done for them and how he can save them. These Buddhists are hearing about Jesus. And since January... Since they moved into their new building there in Myanmar, they've had 12 baptisms. There is a lot of life changes taking place in Myanmar. Now listen, make no mistake about this. That's all the result of a lot of prayers. Now, as surely as I stand before you this morning, I'm here to tell you, we would have loved for that to have happened sooner than three years. But God's timing is always, always perfect. He always has the perfect answer at just the perfect time. And so when you are being blinded by discouragement, you've got to look for the answer. And then one more thing, we need to take time to rejoice. We need to take time to rejoice. And and I think that this is really important as well. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say that when you take time to rejoice, that's when you begin to deal with this discouragement that you have going on in your life. This is what Hannah does here in our text. I want you to look at verse 27. After Hannah has all this discouragement, after Penina is provoking her year after year to where she weeps and she's not able to eat, and then after she has a husband that doesn't understand her and a, and, and a priest that accuses her of being drunk, but then after God does something amazing when it appears that it's completely impossible and she has this son, look at verse 27. Look at what she says to her priest again, Eli. She says, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So we have already talked about this. She's giving God credit for what he's done. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Then Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. I want to make sure you catch this. She's rejoicing in the Lord in the midst of all this discouragement that she had when things weren't turning out the way that she wanted them to, when things were completely out of her control. Then when she finds the answer, she's rejoicing in the Lord. And so listen to me, friends. When you have all this discouragement, when you've got all these things that are happening and they're turning out a way that you didn't expect them to turn out and you realize you have absolutely no control over them whatsoever, There are moments where you have no one and nowhere else to turn but to turn to Him. And when you turn to Him, you can always, you can always rejoice in the Lord. She says, my heart rejoices in the Lord, and the Lord, my horn is lifted high. Now that word for horn there, if you dig into that word, it really could be translated as like power and strength. Now, have any of you ever been there? Like you're discouraged about something, something's happening in life and it's not turning out the way that you want it to and you have no control over it whatsoever and you need some power and strength in that moment. And so listen to me, friends, when you have that discouragement, when there's something that's happening and you have no control over it whatsoever, you have no one and nowhere else to turn for your power and strength but to turn to Him. You can always, always find your power and strength in the Lord. She goes on. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. I love that. I love what Hannah says here. There is no one, no one holy like our Lord. Amen? There is no one, no one who compares to our God. Amen? And there is no one, no one who is like our God. Amen? Friends, you can always rejoice. 
Even in the midst of all this discouragement, you can always rejoice. What does the Bible say about it? In Psalm 5, David says, Let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. In Psalm 68, David says, May the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. In 1 Chronicles 16, it was also David who said, Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Isaiah says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. In Psalm 97, it says, Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. And then I want you to look at what Paul says in the New Testament. This is so important to Paul that he actually says it twice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Even when you have this discouragement, when you're being blinded by discouragement, you can always, always rejoice. I read about six-year-old Johnny and four-year-old Susie. They presented their mom with their Mother's Day gift. It was this spindly, kind of sad-looking houseplant. It really was just not very impressive. But they had spent their own money to buy this gift, and they were really proud of it. And so just as moms do, she encouraged them. She gave them a hug and kissed kissed both of them and she let him know that she was so appreciative that they just thought of her and presented her with this house plant. And then Johnny starts to tell the story. He says, Mom, there were some flowers in that flower shop that you would have loved. But they were just too expensive. We just didn't have enough money. But they would have been perfect for you, Mom. They were these beautiful flowers. They were in a wreath that had all these different colors. There was a ribbon on it that said, Rest in Peace. And Johnny says, Mom, those would have been perfect for you because you just need a little rest. Moms, here's what I want you to do today. And really, this is what I want all of us to do today, okay? Would you take a moment today and just rest? And while you rest, would you just rejoice? Even in the midst of your discouragement, you can always rejoice you can always rejoice because listen friends there is no one who loves you like he does you can always rejoice because there's no one who loves you like he does who is compassionate like he is who is as patient with you as he is there's no one who takes care of your physical needs like he does who is a place of rest like he is who can give us the direction he gives who can help us when we're hurting like he can who provides the peace the way he does who points us to the truth like he can who gives us a purpose like he can who makes us significant like he does who gives us this power his never-ending presence like he does who adopts us into the family like he has who forgives us the way that he does who provides joy the way that he can who provides wisdom like he does who gives us courage like he can who fulfills promises like he does who extends the grace that he extends and brings the hope that he brings there's no one who's given up his son to save us like he has amen you can always rejoice put all of that stuff up against your discouragement and then just take a moment and rest and just rejoice and so here's what i want us to do this morning i want us to take a moment and i want us to just rest and i want us while we rest to just rejoice we're going to participate in a time of communion together like we do every sunday And so I want us to take these next few moments and I want us to just just rest and just rejoice in this love that God demonstrates for us by sending his son Jesus to the cross. I want us to rejoice that Jesus was willing to lay himself down on the cross to give his life, meaning he died so that we could live. And so if you grabbed this prepackaged communion on your way in and if you didn't, feel free to get up and, and go grab it. But the wafer represents his body broken for us. The juice represents his blood poured out for us. And so we're going to take a few moments, and I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to give you some time to just privately where you are to just take this moment to rest and rejoice. Rejoice in what Jesus has done for you on the cross, and just remember his sacrifice. And after a few moments, then we're going to sing a song together, and while we sing, maybe you're here today and there's something that's really discouraging that's going on in your life right now, right? Like there's something that is not turning out the way that you thought it was going to turn out. It's not turning out the way that you expected it to turn out. And you realize now as you sit here this morning, you have no control over it whatsoever, but he does. And so maybe you'd like for somebody to just pray with you. 
And so there's going to be some folks in our prayer room. It's up here at the front of the room to my right. And so while we sing this song after a time of communion, uh, you can make your way into the prayer room and somebody will be there and they'd love to just pray with you this morning, okay? And so let me pray and then we're going to give you a few moments. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be just kind of quiet in here. We're going to give you a few moments to just rest and just rejoice in what Jesus has done for you and then Andy will come back and invite us to sing a song together. And then while we sing, if we can pray uh, with you, please make your way into the prayer room. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can always rejoice. We can rejoice for who you are. We we can rejoice for what you've done and, and for what you're doing in our lives right in this moment. And so, Father, in these next few moments, may we just rest together here for a second. And may we just rejoice that you sent your son to give his life for us. May we just remember him in this time of communion together. Father, may we remember his body broken for us. May we remember his blood poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. And Father, we thank you that you have a, a plan for each one of us. Help us to trust in your plan even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's hard even when we can't understand it. Help us to know that when we are out of control, you are in control. And so may we just trust you with all of our heart that you might make a path straight, that you might bring this comfort and this peace to our hearts. And Father, we thank you for the answers that you give to us. Answers that maybe some of us are waiting for right now. Maybe we've been waiting for a few moments. Maybe we've been waiting for a few hours, a few days, a few months, maybe even a few years. We've been waiting for you to answer. But we know, Father, you'll have the perfect answer at the perfect time. So help us, Father, look for those answers. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. And we take these next few moments to just remember him and his sacrifice for us. To rejoice in what he's done for us on the cross. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 What a great reminder. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And we're going to do just that now. If you want to stand with us and sing. Good. 
If you guys want to take a seat, this is the exciting part of service, the most exciting part, and turn your attention this direction.
accept Jesus and be baptized, and they're pretty excited, especially this one. So I'm going to ask them to gather to repeat after me, and you, you can join if you'd like. Uh, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I accept him. your confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This one's uh, super excited. <laughs> and Siandra, upon your confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a great way to end today. Go ahead and everyone on your feet and let's sing some more songs.
God won't fail. Amen? Hey, these guys did a great job today, didn't they? Good job, guys. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Be sure we have an opportunity to serve the community at Sparks in the Park this year. So check out the table in this back corner. See what you can do to help out. It's great that we as a church can be involved in that community event. Otherwise, have a great week, and we'll see you soon.